Thank you, Dave and Corey, for a really outstanding talk. Uh, questions from the audience? Can you repeat the questions? Yeah, what, what, he's asking, what, why is the base cooked egg translucent, whereas a normal egg and, in fact, the acid cooked egg are white? And the honest answer is, I don't really know. Harold, do you know? <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, I'm guessing usually what, um, what the reason that something turns white is that you get a lot of scattering of light. And what that means is that you have structuration of the gels on the order of the wavelength of light, uh, half a micron or so. And so it must be that on the denaturing and restructuring of the gel in the, when you heat it, um, you form these disordered structures of the same order wavelength of the light. And whatever is happening in the base cooking egg, um, it's not forming that structure. The structure will either be much larger or much smaller. Yeah, so he's asking, really what are the technologies that have revolutionized or really changed the field of cooking? And Corey, you can have well, that I think more that. than uh, uh, new technologies. I think it, there are existing technologies that have been applied to cooking that has really changed uh, what we're able to do as chefs. And that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier uh, when I first started by saying it, it's just a great time to be working as a chef because for the first time you have a, access outside of, of an industrial company to work with these things at your restaurant and to be able to interact with scientists and food scientists. And so it's, it's really not about new technologies necessarily or new equipment in, in cooking, but it's about applying them to cooking at, at the restaurant level. Uh, the question was, uh, well, some of these techniques that are typically seen at uh, fine dining restaurants, will they eventually trickle down to more casual restaurants? And I think the answer is that they already have. Um, you see sous vide cooking done all over the place. Um, and that's, that's uh, at any price point, or at any level of cuisine. And you'll see more and more of that as we go, um, making, making things uh, easier, making, thing, making things more consistent, um, even making a gel or cooking an egg. Uh, and, and you see that already. <laughs> OK, uh, so, the, so the question was, um, how and when do you uh, test new recipes or work on new techniques or uh, be innovative um, while you're operating a restaurant? Uh, and, and the answer is uh, uh, it happens all the time, and it's not necessarily scheduled. Sometimes it's scheduled when it, when it involves some kind of collaboration with, with a third party, um, whether it's someone from a university or someone from a, a food scientist from a, a manufacturing company. Um, but it happens all the time, and sometimes it happens because you see something and you're inspired by it, or sometimes you conceive a dish and, and you can't figure out how to get there. Um, but I think more and more uh, what's happening is that um, chefs aren't limiting themselves to being creative with, with flavor combinations, where I think that's where a lot of the creativity was maybe 10, 20 years ago. Um, that's about uh, being able to figure out the technique to execute something that you're inspired to do. Uh, but it happens all the time. And yes, yeah, sometimes it involves copious notes. Um, I mean, we, we, we have uh, every, everything in our kitchen is, is a recipe. We have a recipe for everything. Um, <laughs> cooking an egg, we have a recipe for. Uh, no, that sounds funny, but it, it's really not. Because when, when, I, when I started cooking and I was shown how to poach an egg, it was uh, heat up a pot of water, and you cook it just under a bubble. Well, what temperature is that, right? But um, as, as, uh, as we progress and we try to evolve and, and refine things, it's, it's really important to document the things that we do. Cool. Well, it ha the, the question was, uh, what's the starting point for a dish, right? Is it the technique, or is it, um, is, is it the existing technique that lets you achieve new things, or is it the, the interest in doing something new that makes you go out and find out how to do it, right? Um, well, in the case of the shark fin, it really wasn't about either one of those things. It's about trying to capture a certain emotion. And the emotion is, is something very celebratory and a special occasion, which is when you have shark fin soup. So it really started with that and figuring out how do we offer that. How do we put something on the menu where when you hear it and when it's brought to your table, you, you immediately are in a place of celebration and um, of a festive occasion. But to answer your question, it, it's both. And it's not exclusive one or the other. Um, sometimes it's about um, hearing or reading about a new technique and, and thinking that it's amazing and finding out, wow, how, how, how could this uh, apply and, and be, be relevant to what we do? Um, sometimes it's about, uh, I mean, these guys dropped an egg in a, in a base liquid. I mean, I've never seen that before. And sometimes it's about seeing something like that and figuring out, OK, well, what else can you do with that? But other times it's about um, having a, a dish that you want to do and figuring out how to do it, just like uh, the kimchi, where, we, where I really wanted to have those flavors in something that was a hand canapé, very clean, one bite, 
um, with different textures and figure out how, how do we do that. So it's both. So he's asking, why don't we uh, work with chemists as well? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Maybe we, should. we clearly should. <laughs> And we should work with biologists. I mean, as uh, Wendell said at the beginning, cooking is in the end really in its science, a very multidisciplinary science. Um, it just so happened that Michael and I put the class together and we emphasized what we know. And if you look at these foods, they're just the materials that I study as a physicist. So it was a natural thing for me to focus on those. But it's not the exclusion of anything else. So the question is, uh, once the recipe is documented, it should be very easy to replicate at your home, right? Because you just follow the steps. OK, so what are the biggest challenges to being able to reproduce restaurant food at home? Um, it's probably labor. And no, it's probably labor and access to the kind of products that we have access to. Reproduce it at home or reproduce it from time to time? Oh, yeah, time to time, different, by different steps. Every day, how do you get it? Oh, I see, I see. Well, there, there's, there's, I mean, with, with, with any kind of cooking, um, there's a lot of variables. Um, and, and the more precise the recipes are, and um, the less variables there are, but there, there, there are still variables. Um, some things are um, easy to control, um, and some things are more difficult to control. Um, you know, luckily, there's, there's, there's machines that allow to control temperatures. Um, you can control time. Um, but there's, there's properties of the inherent product that are out of our control sometimes as a chef. Uh, when you get a certain kind of beef that's different from one to the, to the next, there will be some variation. Um, but that's, for me, that's not an obstacle. Um, I don't look at that as an obstacle or a problem. I think, I think that's what is great about cooking. And that's kind of the beauty of cooking, is that you're, you're adapting to nature. So you have to do the control experiment. Uh, the short answer is no, I, I haven't. Um, <laughs> but is shark, shark's fins, the shark fin, um, the faux shark fin that we're making, um, is something that made sense to try to recreate. Um, for a variety of reasons, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, recreating meat or fish or things like that, um, I haven't even thought about, to be honest with you. Just a comment on that. We, we're going to introduce Cord to some people who are uh, working on things. It's like cartilage regeneration, and so he'll, he'll, he'll learn a little bit about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, companies that uh, are special, specialized in aromas, which are the fragrance companies, have developed very uh, advanced tools. They basically have uh, what are called headspace um, instruments that have a controlled volume above something that has a smell, and they have a mass spec that's attached to that. So they and they will um, have people smell things and say, "What's the smallest amount that you can smell?" And they'll correlate that with different smells, and they'll know how long it lasts. So it's actually very sophisticated the the kind of measurements that have been done. Well, I mean, it's, it's certainly hard to predict what, what cooking will be like in 15 years. Um, just, like, just like I said 15 years ago, I, I would never imagine that something like this would be happening. Um, but I think that, every, with that you, know, you hope that the next generation of, uh, of chefs or, or scientists are better than the previous one. Um, so really, I mean, it's, it's an exciting time to be working as a chef and being involved with food. So uh, David Chang, one of the uh, chefs who comes to uh, lecture at Harvard, um, is interested in uh, fermentation. He's trying to explore the potential uses of fermentation. So I mean, that's going to be something that will be important. Of course, my own view is 15 years from now, a prerequisite of studying physics will be learning how to cook. <laughs> um, we, use, uh, uh, we use a synthetic product in, in, uh, in our kitchen. Um, which is basically to solidify uh, oils, like olive oil, which from monastery. Um, but other than that, uh, we don't really use any. But it's not because uh, you know, it's, it's a philosophical issue. Um, they're, they're, uh, I think there's, it's, it's different for every person, and it's different for um, every chef, and sometimes even different for every application. I believe that uh, as long as technology and sometimes synthetic products are not a shortcut to making something that's flavorful or something that feels good in your mouth um, and doesn't compromise the, the final quality or the process or the traditional way of making things, it's fine. Um, but you know, I, I can't, I can't uh, stand here now and, and say yes or no. I, I'd really have to think about that case by case.
So I have a question. What, uh, you guys both. Um, what makes emulsions taste so good? <laughs> we, could, we could ask a real expert here. Okay. Can you answer that, Harold? No, I can, I can tell you the answer that I get from Harold, but you can. <laughs> Um, basically, it's the it's more viscous, so it uh, runs over your tongue your tongue more uh, smoothly. It uh, releases the flavors and the aromas more slowly. Um, it gets it to your to to where your receptors are um, in a sort of a more controlled fashion. Um, I think in general, also, it's a way of ma making um, mixing fats with waters, um, and fats are something that is more pleasing? <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question, because from, from a culinary point of view, uh, and, and we talked about this uh, last week, um, we make gels for many of the same reasons why you would make an emulsion. It's to alter the texture and, and the mouthfeel and, and the rate at which you perceive that flavor. So it's, it's like a slow release. But anyway, with that, uh, let's uh, uh, please uh, join us uh, for the reception outside. We're going to have some samples of the shark fin so you can see what the mouth feels like. And please join me uh, in thanking Dave and Corey for coming out here. <laughs> <laughs>